Hello, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Is my mic working? How are we doing here? All right. How loud is the air conditioner that I just brought back? Can you hear that? Right, I'm going to take your... Um, silence as a maybe. I'll turn the air conditioner off. Okay. I'm going to leave it on then. We'll see how it goes. Let me know if, uh, <laughs> um, let me know if it gets distracting uh, and we're just going to keep on going. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Yeah, big thanks to uh, McKenna MK Mills, MK Mills for um, this air conditioner. It is monstrous up here. Um, I hope everybody is staying relatively cool if you're in Portland or elsewhere. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I know that there's a lot going on right now in the world, so I appreciate you taking the time to come and enjoy this stream with me. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, the enclosure of the commons, and I'm sorry if that doesn't sound like a very sexy topic. Uh, I promise it's going to be interesting. It's just, it's a sort of like this particular series of laws and events is critical to understanding, I think, a lot of uh, elements of uh, our current situation and uh, traditions of social and economic order. Uh, so bear with me. Um, as always, ask questions. I'll try to check the chat. Uh, let me know if anything I say doesn't make sense. And uh, we're just going to get into it. So yeah, we're going to be talking about um, all sorts of things. And so to begin with, we need to talk about um, the commons. So what do I mean by the commons? So for most of this lecture, I'm going to be referring to England almost exclusively, but the way that these lands worked in the rest of Europe was largely the same. Um, common land in England specifically is, or was, owned collectively. Um, it, uh, in, an, in one way or another, uh, certain people had traditional rights. So, in England, uh, common people had the right to uh, graze livestock, uh, collect firewood, collect um, turf for fuel. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, uh, Matt is going to um, humiliate me with his knowledge of other uh, common lands. Uh, this, by the way, before I even get into it, this largely excludes uh, serfs in Eastern Europe and, and other land sharing arrangements, though there were serfs in England. Um, Anyway, so a person who had a right over common land or, or held it jointly with others was called a commoner. Uh, this was the origin or one of the origins of the term. Um, and the common lands in England were generally part of a manor, a part of a state uh, held by a manor lord, a feudal lord, uh, basically uh, by permission or grant or leased uh, from the crown or another, generally the crown or a particularly powerful a uh, noble person. Uh, this is the origin of the idea or origin of, of, of one of the core elements of feudalism. Um, so the the king granted the right to the land. The king technically owned the land, but he granted the right to the, right to the land to landowners, to nobles, which then uh, sort of um, held control over it. But uh, on the common lands, on the manor lands themselves, certain areas and certain regions were free for use by by peasants by commoners you could uh graze livestock you could hunt you could fish again within reason you could collect firewood and other things um and you could plant again uh, there were limitations this um this diagram you see sees the uh, shows some of the ways that it's divided up uh in certain areas certain land was held for crops or for other um, held aside for uh, for hunting, but the, the point is that as a common person in England, 
you could expect to, uh, even though your life was generally shit, you were a, a dirt par farmer, you uh, lived in the mud, uh, you had no rights, you could at least be sure that um, if you needed to, you could go gather firewood, you could uh, graze your sheep, you could uh, find somewhere to, to, you know, eat something generally. Um, not to say that it was a good life, but uh, there were certain rights laid down, sort of, this is ancient, it depends on who you ask, but it's ancient you know, Anglo-Saxon law, or, or even uh, further back, and, uh, you know, has uh, permissions for the commoners to behave in a certain way, and have certain rights to the land. Um, but, it did not stay that way forever. So, it's important that you understand for uh, the purposes of this lecture, um, the rough idea of the English monarchy, which from the very beginning um, has been, uh, the king is not especially powerful in England and has not been. Um, the, the landholders and the nobles have always had more rights than elsewhere. And this was really kicked into high gear with the Magna Carta, uh, our, you know, the very famous origin of things like habeas corpus and uh, uh, right to a speedy trial, etc., etc., etc. This was uh, a, um, a which was extracted from King John in 1215 after a, a group of rebellious barons uh, fought him to a standstill. Um, there's a really uh, awesome and terrible uh, medieval movie, I think it's called Ironclad, it stars James Purefoy, where he's like a Templar knight uh, fighting in a castle with King James. Anyway, it's sweet. Uh, anyway, uh, the Magna Carta provided for certain rights for the for the nobility mostly. Um, this did not grant substantial rights to the regular people of England, but it's still, uh, some would say, a uh, an important legal document. Uh, we can argue about that later if you'd like. A key provision of the Magna Carta and other uh, concessions extracted by the, um, the Parliament and the nobility is that the king cannot pass new taxes without approval of Parliament. This wasn't always difficult, but if Parliament was being recalcitrant or the king was unpopular, it could mean that there was no way to raise money. Now, when the Parliament passed two um, relevant laws in 1235 and 1285. These were the Statute of Merton and the Statute of Westminster, and these allowed for enclosure of manorial common land. Uh, basically seizure or fencing or um, taking it and allowing it to be used for other purposes. Uh, this was not, these uh, statutes were not employed very often, but they were on the books, so bear that in mind. Statute of Merton. Things, however, were not great in England. Um, in 1348, uh, a plague, uh, sorry, uh, known as the Black Death, uh, crossed from mainland Europe into England, and it killed, uh, in England, around 50% of the population, as states uh, or estimates vary. It was quite bad. A lot of people died. Uh, substantial portions of the uh, countryside were depopulated, uh, all of the major urban centers were devastated. Um, however, 50%, uh, th there are varying estimates, but it was quite deadly in England. Yet, yeah, things have not changed. Uh, there, was a, there was a real brief 200-year window where things were growing great for England, and uh, we're past it. We're, we're back to the way that things have always been, which is not going great. Um, the death rate, however, was lower among the peasantry because they were more spe spread out, they were rural, they were not necessarily exposed to carriers of the plague. Um, and, I'm sorry, that's the exact opposite of what I meant to say. Um, the peasants died in large numbers uh, because they <laughs> were poor and malnourished. And um, that meant that suddenly land was plentiful. Uh, manpower was in short supply, laborers could charge more for their work, and as a consequence, wages went up, uh, and the profits of the landowners were eroded, uh, trade and commerce 
uh, shut down as all of a sudden people could uh, negotiate for their labor and uh, demand higher wages. Um, no, I, I, I misspoke about uh, how it affected the peasants. Uh, it affected the peasants quite badly. It affected everybody quite badly. But um, um, So anyway, uh, in order to deal with this uh, uh, totally um, untenable state of affairs where uh, the working people could demand uh, higher wages for their labor, the authorities passed some emergency legislation, the parliament did. Uh, first, the Ordinance of Laborers in 1349, and then the Statute of Laborers in 1351. These uh, attempted to uh, fix wages at pre-plague levels, um, making it a crime to refuse to work uh, or break an existing contract, and imposing substantial fines on those who transgressed. Um, this was, as you might imagine, uh, tremendously unpopular. Uh, people didn't like it. The peasants were uh, already... Uh, struggling. Uh, many of them had died, um, and uh, in order to finance the uh, incipient A Hundred Years' War, uh, which I'm not really going to go into, I have chosen the wrong image for this part of the talk. This is, I, mean, I haven't even gotten to what's going on here yet. Um, eventually, uh, the, the king passed a four pence per head poll tax, to try to raise funds to fight the French, as one does. Uh, the peasants were not happy about this. Uh, a uh, royal official, John Bampton, uh, tried to collect those taxes in uh, Brentwood, which led to a violent confrontation, which spread all across England, uh, becoming what is called the Peasants' War of 1381. This is what you're seeing. Uh, the king is talking to them. I don't know. Um, a wide spectrum of rural society, including artisans, village officials, uh, rose up in uh, protest. They burned court records. They opened the jails. Uh, they sought a reduction, obviously, in taxes, but also an end to serfdom and a removal of these uh, unelected, unfair uh, senior officials and law courts. Um, many of these peasants were inspired by the teachings of John Ball, a lollard uh, and radical priest who preached that all humans should be treated equally as descendants of Adam and Eve, and who asked, when Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman? That there were no, there are no, there are lords in Adam or uh, in Eden is basically what he was saying. Um, anyway, the peasants lost. Uh, they extracted some, you know, things got a little bit better, but uh, they got killed. Um, sorry, it's generally how this goes. Um. So, consequences. Um, so, you've probably heard this bit about um, the decrease in um, in population and how it drove up wages and uh, allowed the working class to uh, um, advocate for themselves. And you may have even heard it call, uh, attributed, heard this called a. Uh, an incipient factor of uh, the growth of capitalism and uh, merchant classes, etc., uh, even the Industrial Revolution. Um, but that's not everything that this the plague and subsequent social unrest caused. Uh, since the large parts of England had been depopulated, um, there and there was an increased demand for wool, especially from uh, the the merchant houses of the Netherlands. Uh, suddenly, it became very attractive to enclose these commons uh, if you wanted to turn uh, useless land that was just feeding people into um, valuable pasturage, uh, generally for sheep. Uh, in the Tudor period, uh, enclosure became substantially more common, and they were un undertaken usually unilaterally by the landowner and resulted in the loss of common rights and sometimes the destruction of entire villages. Um, this practice was unpopular, uh, denounced by the church, and opposed somewhat by the Tudor monarchs, who tried to place some limitations on the practice of enclosure. Um, this widespread uh, enclosure made a lot of people very wealthy, but it also used up arable land and made England especially vulnerable to a famine and food shortages. Um, but it did not slow down the process. So, almost immediately, um, this uh, practice of enclosure, uh, which really picked up in the early 16th century, 
Um, where was I? Um, caused, in addition to um, economic problems, uh, substantial social problems. Uh, commoners expelled from their lands or unable to work uh, could become paupers, uh, people who were dependent upon the, um, the state for their wealth. And if they lost their homes, uh, they would become vagrants, uh, which was illegal in uh, England. It was I illegal to be homeless uh, and punishable by whipping or branding. Um, a a follow-up to those lovely labor acts, uh, the Vagabonds Act of 1547, uh, issued by Edward VI, ordained that if anyone refuses to work, he shall be condemned as a slave to the person who has denounced him as an idler. The master has the right to force him to do any work, no matter how vile, with whip and chains. If the slave is absent for a fortnight, he is condemned to slavery for life and is to be branded on forehead or back with the letter S. If he runs away three times, he is to be executed as a felon. If it happens that a vagabond has been idling about for three days, he is to be taken to his birthplace, branded with a red-hot iron with the letter V on his breast, and set to work in chains on the roads or at some other labor. Every master may put an iron ring round the neck, arms, or legs of his slave by which to know him more easily. Um, additionally, uh, enclosure exacerbated the financial troubles of the English crown, which was already pretty poor at managing its finances, and after a hundred years of non-stop fighting with France and other people, uh, had uh, serious uh, issues with the exchequer. Um, taxation relied on commoners owning and working lands, and it was not as easy to collect revenue from the enclosed manors without, of course, passing new taxation laws, which had to, if you'll remember, be approved by Parliament, which was largely made up of noble lords and wealthy landowners who benefited themselves from enclosure. So, beginning in 1549 with Ket's Rebellion, Agrarian, which is what you're seeing here, this is, the guy in the center is Ket, uh, Agrarian revolts swept all over the nation, uh, and all the way up through sort of the 1630s. Uh, the idea was to restore security, stability, and the old common system. Um, people basically wanted to end the practice of enclosures and allow them to live and work on the land again. Uh, dogs cannot be vagabonds. Let's see. So, um, in the 1840s, um, Charles I of England, um, it would take too much to discuss the uh, the causes and um, circumstances of the English Civil War, but let's just say that Charles I um, tried to... Uh, he exceeded his authority. He tried to um, establish certain uh, religious precedents, especially in Scotland, where they were unpopular. He also tried to curtail the material and legal rights of the Parliament. Uh, he was... he because Parliament would not pass any new taxes. He came up with extremely creative ways to raise funds. Uh, like, for example, there was a, a ship fee where uh, uh, a certain amount of money could be levied for defense of the crown uh, against uh, enemies from the sea. Um, so every now and then the, the crown could raise funds that way. But Charles just kept doing it. Um, and so the Parliament said, hey, wait a minute, that's a tax. Uh, and this kept on happening until uh, Charles went to war with Parliament. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, um, uh, Oliver Cromwell rose to power, the uh, Puritan leader of the new model army, um, which was made up of uh, all sorts of uh, religious fanatics and uh, insane, awful nobles, but also a lot of people who really did want to fight and overthrow the king and... Um, you know, create a more equal England. Um, and there were two or three separate civil wars. Eventually, uh, Cromwell fought, Cromwell and the New Model Army defeated Charles, and they tried to extract concessions from him, tried to uh, reach an agreement. Uh, Charles I uh, could not, and tried to run away and raise an army. And so they killed him. Uh, a, a beautiful, wondrous, wondrous uh, regicide um, in... Uh, 1649, Charles I was beheaded, uh, accused of treason, uh, and beheaded for crimes against England. Uh, this, of course, uh, turned the entire social order upside down. Uh, everything was topsy-turvy. Uh, there were no rules. 
the you know uh, uh, Protestantism was run amok. Uh, people were fighting against the Anglican Church. There were all these Puritans and Quakers and antinomians and all these wild and differing ideas of what it would mean to be English and what it would mean to um, to be a Christian in England. And uh, a commonwealth was declared. Uh, Cromwell was ostensibly in charge. There was, I'm not going to tell you about the, the official, there was a grand council or something. Basically, Cromwell ended up as a dictator after not very long. Um, but for a brief and shining moment, there was, um, there was, uh, you know, a, a spirit of excitement and radicalism and uh, an opportunity for things to change. And uh, out of this emerged a bunch of interesting types of people, including first and foremost. Is this a is this a is this what they teach English children in school? Charles the first walked and talked half an hour after his head was cut off. Uh, that's handy. That's a good rhyme. Um, <laughs> tolerant left, indeed. Um, so. Uh, among others were the Levelers, uh, and the Levelers were basically, uh, you might think of them as one of the first political parties in England. They had an agenda, and they had a manifesto, and they had sort of an idea yes, for how like, I guess, uh, England like, should go for forward. Uh, they, most of them were men of the army who had fought the new model, see, model see army. They were not also, like, the officers and the, the noblemen, they were usually the, the soldiers. So um, so. Cromwell was shaping up England to be a kind of plutocratic regime with Cromwell and a bunch of other rich landowners at the top. Um, there had been a discussion of social and legal reforms, but the agreement that they had reached with Charles I uh, still allowed for the crown to veto them, and there were a lot of loopholes. And so the, the men of the army were dissatisfied, and in 1647, before the execution of Charles I, uh, a series of debates were held. Um, uh, in 1647, the, the Putney debates, um, where uh, an agitator. These were the men who were elected by the army to speak to the um, the grandees, the the leaders of the army. Uh, the agitator Roger Robert Everard presented a document called the um, Agreement of the People. Uh, this manifesto was uh, republican and democratic. It demanded that England be settled from the bottom up uh, rather than the top down. Um, it called for universal suffrage. Um, and for uh, for rights, uh, legal freedom, and for religious liberty, um, the Levelers were inspired very much by a uh, a certain uh, Bible verse. Most of these people are extremely religious, which goes without saying. Um, but Acts ten thirty four reads, uh, "Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons." Uh, the Levelers took this to mean that God did not recognize rank or social class, and uh, so they demanded uh, universal suffrage, votes for all men, so um, uh, and for uh, religious freedom, uh, the, the freedom to worship openly, uh, all these different uh, legal rights. Um, their opponents, the grandees, uh, notably uh, Ireton, uh, Cromwell's uh, son-in-law, I believe, argued that a person must have a permanent interest of this kingdom to be entitled to vote meaning owning property. Interestingly, one of the arguments that Ireton used was that, oh, so if somebody just moves to England and lives here, they can vote? How is that fair? Um, so uh, nothing has changed in uh, 400 years. Um, the levelers were committed to popular sovereignty, uh, suffrage, uh, inequality for the law, religious tolerance. Um, they did not, however, they were not communists. They, they still believed in private property and did not want to redistribute it. However, other people did. Notably, the Diggers. Uh, the Diggers, who were led by a radical named um, Gerard Wynne Stanley. Uh, you saw his quote at the very beginning. Um, and Gerard Wynne Stanley published a pamphlet in the 1840s uh, called The New Law of Righteousness. Um, which drew heavily from uh, the book of Acts, uh, especially verses uh, chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, which reads, All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Yes, uh, there's a lot of really good um, English and Irish protest uh, movements and music that comes from the diggers. Uh, you should look it up. They're very cool. Um, when Stanley argued that in the beginning of the time God made the earth, not one word was spoken at the beginning that one branch of mankind should rule over another, but selfish imaginations did set up one man to teach and rule over another. Um, so, uh, using the Bible as a as a as a framework, uh, he uh, when Stanley and his followers called for the abolition of property and aristocracy, uh, claiming there were no masters or slaves under the new covenant. Um, he wrote in the manifesto that everyone that is born in the land may be fed by the earth, his mo that the mother that has brought him forth, not one lording over another, but all looking upon each other as equals in creation, so that our maker may be glorified in the work of his own hands, and that everyone may see that he is no respecter of persons, but equally loves his whole creation. Uh, so the diggers uh, decided to just sort of cut out the middleman and just settled and started planting. Uh, they were basically squatters. They were squatters and sort of agrarian uh, anarchists and communists. They would just sort of set up in enclosed commons and manor lands and start planting. Um, when Stanley declared that true freedom lies where a man receives his nourishment and preservation, and that is in the use of the earth. Uh, some people have taken this as sort of like a primitive uh, eco-socialism. Uh, when Stanley really felt a, a closeness to um, the the land and believe that uh, the, the key to freedom and liberty and to uh, each person being equal was in fair use of the land. Um, unfortunately, uh, the diggers were relatively peaceful and so they would settle on the manor land and the manor owners would say, hey, fuck you, and then they would summon the police or the army or whatever and uh, drive them off. They often did this by accusing them of being a different heretical dissenting group, uh, the ranters. Uh, who design, deny the authority of churches, uh, of scripture, of current ministry and services, uh, and called on all men to listen to the divine within them. Uh, they were pantheistic, essentially, that uh, claiming that God is in every creature. They rejected traditional morality, uh, causing many contemporaries to paint them as sexual deviants. This was only exacerbated by the fact that they tended to be nudists, uh, either because of some sort of... Uh, a protest against social norms or uh, a rejection of property, uh, etc. Uh, in the end, uh, the diggers um, were kind of squashed. Their radical ideas were, were thrown underground. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the Commonwealth did not last. Like I said, Cromwell set himself up as basically a dictator. His son turned out to not be up to the task of carrying on the um, the rule of Oliver Cromwell and uh, Charles II was restored to the throne. Um, uh, the, the English decided that uh, they wanted a king after all. Um, now, I like to stop and, and talk about uh, moments in history where, where things might have gone differently. Um, and uh, I think that one of the worst decisions in the history of the West is allowing Charles II to come back to the throne. Uh, England had gotten rid of their monarch and they decided that, uh, no, we, we want a monarch back. Uh, and, and you know what? They've still fucking got one. They still have a monarch. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's bad. I think that sucks. Anyway, so Charles II was restored to the throne. The Commonwealth was uh, largely forgotten. All these radical ideas were uh, were squashed. Um, a lot of the, as you well know, Puritans, Quakers, Antinomians, and other radicals uh, fucked off to America, where they could at least uh, worship in relative peace. Um, and a lot of these ideas, uh, the ideas of the diggers and levelers, ended up uh, being a part of the American Revolution. Uh, and this is going to be a, a longer talk about uh, for, for later, but um, there were two distinct American revolutions. There was one that involved the um, you know, your George Washingtons, your John Adams, your wealthy landowners who want uh, freedom to get fucking rich uh, without the crown getting involved. And then there was everybody else who were genuinely fighting for freedom and universal suffrage and uh, individual liberty, all that stuff. 
Um, and the second group, uh, who did all the fighting and dying, um, were heavily influenced by Leveler and Digger ideas, many of uh, whose, uh, many, many of the um, proponents of which had fled, uh, rather than be uh, killed by royalists or oligarchs uh, or, or just seeking a better place to worship. Um, but the enclosure of the commons, uh, which is what we're talking about, really picked up after this. Um, and the Parliament had already begun passing acts to sort of legitimize the process of enclosing. And by the uh, late 18th century, uh, a quarter to a half of all common land had been enclosed. Uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people had been um, displaced. A lot of these people were uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily shipped off to the colonies, America and elsewhere. Sometimes they went uh, as uh, settlers. Sometimes they were literally kidnapped, put on boats, and sent to the colonies. Sometimes they were sent as uh, indentured servants. Um, many of them, however, just sort of uh, moved to the cities and sought work because there was no longer anything for them to do, and if they hung about, they would be declared vagrants and branded. This is also the, the, the traditional story of how the uh, Industrial Revolution began, or a part of it, right? There's this uh, great um, uh, proletariat uh, milling about in the cities, just ready to take up a loom and uh, start producing... Uh, cloth and uh, widgets and nails and whatnot, um, but it wasn't always that uh, that simple. As you see here, uh, this is Ned Ludd, a fictional, unfortunately, um, a radical. Uh, the Luddites, uh, you've probably heard this term before, were people who smashed uh, the new machinery of the Industrial Revolution, the looms, the, the mills, um, all of the different... Uh, uh, devices that were, you know, supposed to make people more productive, but were displacing them and uh, driving down the value of their labor, making it harder for them to um, to make a living. And the Luddites get a real bad rap. No, he's he's not real. Uh, he was made up uh, as a, a sort of like a boogeyman by the government. Uh, he was based off of previous uh, uh, revolutionaries, uh, agitators who were also named Ludd. Sure, she would be like. Um, but these people were not just, uh, the, the, the term Luddite is now used to refer to somebody who is anti-technology, but Luddites it's were the, labor agitators. The, like, they were not anti-technology. They just didn't want to starve. They wanted to be paid fair wages. Uh, and, and this was a sort of spontaneous and widespread social movement to, uh, to attack the property of the landowning classes, the, the owners, so that they could, um, protect their wealth. Or protect their their wages and um, build wealth and uh, fight against sort of the process of capital accumulation. So, why do we care about the enclosure of the commons? Uh, this is interesting. I think it touches on a lot of, of, of cool stuff. But this, I, I like to talk about this because um, to me, this was a critical learning about this was a critical. Um, moment in my uh, radical shift leftwards uh, because well, like, it's, so it's well known and understood obviously that uh, that capitalism was made possible in large part because of um, because of imperialism and colonialism uh, because of uh, slavery of extraction of wealth but it started even Earlier than that, yes. I mean, you can use Luddite. Terms have have meanings, but the 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 it's all connected the um the slandering of Luddites is is kind of anti labor. Yes, it's it's a um you know they're they have been associated with um anti technology sentiments when originally it was anti labor. But I was sort of blown away by the idea that. Um, that this had all belonged to the people, right? That for millennia, for centuries, if not millennia, all this land had been the legal right, and it had been owned in common by the people of England. And then, uh, just because they had the legal and military authority to do so, they just took it. Um, and and this is sort of like a, a critical thing to understand 
about the the it's arguments for and the justifications for modern capitalism. So so Adam Smith, who you see here on the left, I think it's your left, whatever. You know which one's Smith and which one is Karl Marx. Adam Smith argues has this argument around um, accumulation, right? How people became wealthy, right? And, and it's, it's uh, I'm simplifying, but it's basically that some people were more productive and more inventive than others, and they got rich, and they accumulated capital, and then they became capitalists, and then capitalism happened, and, and that's all well and good. Um, Karl Marx rejected this, right? Uh, he called, he, he had a different idea, uh, the primitive accumulation of capital, which entailed taking land, enclosing it, expelling a resident population uh, to create a landless proletariat, and then releasing the land into the privatized mainstream of capital accumulation. Um, and to me, and I think to everybody, I, I feel like this should undermine the very like foundational myth of capitalism, uh, which again is already a very weak myth, but the idea that so somehow the wealthy became wealthy through hard work um, and uh, inventiveness and, uh, you know, doing what uh, must be done, creating value, uh, is, is just on the face of it false. And they, not, not, they didn't even take it by force. They used uh, the, the legal methods and, um, you know, the, the, the hand of the state to essentially disenfranchise and displace uh, their own people, right? The people who th the the manor lords were ostensibly supposed to be looking out for. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I've talked about the diggers and levelers, I've talked about this sort of like radical movement, I've talked about, you know, all of these different through lines that were basically, you know, killed uh, at the end of the Commonwealth and expelled from England. Uh, and those those radical ideas and elements um, have been a part of our shared history for centuries and centuries. You know, the the idea that all land should be held in common, the idea that that we have a right to our to to work the land, to be free, to have um, you know a livelihood, uh, is is centuries and centuries old. It didn't it didn't emerge with the American Revolution. It didn't emerge with the French Revolution. It didn't emerge with the rights of man, right? It's been something that common people have understood for uh, as long as they have been oppressed by uh, by the oligarchs, and um, and it's it's funny because what keeps happening during this period is uh, there are people who take the Bible seriously, right? They read it and they say, "Oh, well, this seems pretty clearly to be." Uh, to suggest that uh, that nobody should have too much shit uh, and that a rich man can't enter the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc. So we should act as such. And then all the, the, the nobility and the, the, the monarchs, they say, whoa, 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 that's not what we meant uh, when we wanted you to, you know, follow the maxims of the church. Um, and so I, I just, I think this is such a tremendously interesting and important part of history. I think that it is uh, a tragedy, that it is not taught more widely, and that the uh, the enclosure of the commons isn't uh, something that, that we all uh, understand uh, as a critical moment uh, in the change from from feudalism to to the modern day, uh, rather than sort of the story that we're told about how it happened. And uh, I hope you all listened, enjoyed listening to me um, ramble about this. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'll be here next week. I'm not entirely sure uh, oh god the tragedy of the commons um, I'm going to need a whole nother lecture to talk about the tragedy of the commons <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I'll answer that question another time thank you all everybody thanks for tuning in uh, stay safe stay healthy and uh, have a good weekend